Good morning. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ, uh, June the 27th. We're glad you're here. Pray the Lord blesses you for having been here. We're going to be, if you're watching this online, you need your Bible, you need your grape juice, and uh, watch the video for the songs that you're going to be singing. And we pray God blesses you. Hope you have some unleavened bread. And if you have any questions, feel free to email us or, or contact us through our website. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. We're glad you're here. Pray the Lord blesses you for having been here and blesses you in your life because the Lord's the only one who can bless us. Now, there is one thing in your little papers. You notice it's kind of thick today. The reason it's kind of thick is not because I'm preaching extra long, <laughs> but it's because there's some pages for a new song that Tiny led last week. He's going to lead again for us this week at the end of at the end of the the. Uh, um, sermon, and so we want you to have the song, so you have it there with you, and hopefully those people that are outside have their songs. By the way, if you're outside and you need paper or you need your communion cup, give a give a honk, and one of the deacons will go out there and help you help you with that. Uh, but Tiny has that song for us, so we'll be singing that towards the end. So make sure you do have your paper; you will need that. Uh, it will be on the screen for those of you that are in here, but sometimes it's easier to see if you have it on on paper. If you can't see the screen, you need a book. There's books in the back that have been sanitized for you. Please pick one up so that you can uh, worship with us because we believe worship is something that we do together and individually. So we're, we're glad that all of you are here. And it, it's, it's good to see um, Zoe and her family back with us. Um, they were out of town for a while and we're glad they're, they're back and that their trip went, went well. Uh, nothing else then, we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to Brother Tiny. He's gonna be, oh, let me remind you, we worship. Uh, at the appropriate time, we'll let you know when you can send your kids back in order for them to participate in, in We Worship. Um, and remember that Brother Sandy back there in the back over there, that guy sitting next to that window, he always puts out a, a video for the kids during the week. And this is the video that he's put out for them. Uh, there's the link to it. I know it's kind of long, but if you just go online and look and look it up, you can see the link and make sure that your, your kids, your grandkids, your friends, even you listen to it. Uh, sometimes they're kind of interesting. Uh, and remember that uh, all of our Sunday morning lessons and all of our Wednesday morning lessons and our Sunday morning lesson that we don't actually meet for, they're all online. And it, it, they're easy to get to if you go to our website, but it's even easier if you just go to YouTube and under the search, just put in the just put in Mac Road Church of Christ, spell, all spelled out, and a circle will come up that says Mac Road Church of Christ, press on it, and all of our stuff is on there. And so we want you to, to be able to be listening to the word of God. And besides all that, as the elders do here, and the deacons do here, we encourage each of you to be reading through your Bible yearly. So we want everybody to be reading through your Bible every day because that's the way God talks to us. I, I know you might think he talks to us through the preacher or somebody else, but he mainly talks to us by reading the word of God. So get the word of God inside of you and it will definitely help you in your life. Appreciate everybody being here. Everybody sit up straight and let's get ready to praise God today. Good morning, Mac Road. Good morning. Good morning.
I got an early start up here. <laughs> you, you were singing so good, you know, uh, I don't have to wake you up this morning. <laughs> but did you thank God this morning? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, I did too. It's good to be here this morning. It's always a blessing. I'm, when I come here, I'm, I'm right at home. Amen. I could just feel, I won't tell you how I feel. <laughs> But it's good. It's good to look at you and see all the beautiful faces and all of the smiles. And, you know, do you smile like this all the time? Yeah, I bet. But anyway, God is wonderful. God is beautiful. He woke you up this morning and put breath in that body that you got and got you ready to come here this morning and praise him. And I pray that's what you do while you're here. I know we don't do it but just on Sunday, but I do it every day. Amen. And thank you, God. I'm going to tell you what happened to me the other day when I was driving down the freeway. I don't want to preach, you know, Troy did that already. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but I, this guy came by me. He must have been doing 100 driving. And I, I, I got right behind him. And I said, look at that. Crazy guy. I didn't, I'm going to tell you what I call it, but I said crazy guy. <laughs> and I happened to look down at my screen, and I was doing 82. <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> and how, how often do you do that to other people? Yeah. You know, you punch your finger at them, and you be doing the same thing. <laughs> but then you catch yourself, and then, I know, you, I won't say you feel stupid. But you get that feeling, say, you know, you, you think about how you blame other people for things and you're doing the same thing yourself. Yep. So you, I'm praying for all of you, you know, that we'll do better in life. And that's what we do to God. We pray God that God help us to do better, you know, <coughs> and stop just pointing our fingers at other people and blaming them for the things they do. Right. And may we do better. Okay. Shall we go to the God in prayer? Yeah. Heavenly Father, 
Forgive us our sins, Lord, which we commit to our words and our thoughts and our deeds. We thank you for the blessing that you bestow upon us daily, Lord, that we be able to just be able to just move around and breathe the fresh air that you've given us, Lord. We thank you for this. We thank you for this congregation that we have here, Lord. We thank that we thank you for blessing it, Lord, and sending us here today where we can listen to the word that our brother Mike is bringing us out of your most holy and gracious book. Amen. I pray that these words we receive, Lord, will touch us and make us a better Christian and a person. And may we just learn to love one another and appreciate one another, Lord, and learn how to just respect one another, Lord. And we thank you for this. We thank you for this opportunity. This is a daily thing for us. And we make mistakes, Lord, but forgive us. We're only just human beings that's trying to make it on this earth. Amen. And thank you, Lord. Thank you for just, just touching us and, you know, letting us realize that we're not crazy. We're just praying, Lord, that you would just instill the things in us that we will do better each day. And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for this blessing. I pray that as I myself is coming up on the rough side of the mountain, I pray that you don't put many stones in my way, Lord, that I'll stumble and fall. We'll have to get back up and do it again. But I thank you for this, Lord. Thank you for this congregation. May we love one another. And may we have a safe trip to and through this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Number one seven. One seven zero. I want to thank all of y'all for, for your prayers. Yeah. And uh, thank my uh, sister, wife, for this uh, Father's Day gift. Oh, nice. hey, yeah. um, it's a bracelet, but it's an unusual, unique bracelet. And I'll let y'all get to I'll show it to y'all uh, after service. And I want to thank uh, my sister, Lorraine. Uh, she brought me some stuff there that uh, seems to be crazy <coughs> on my throat. Oh. <laughs> and I was drinking, and then she said, I didn't see anything, but it's on me. <laughs> but uh, it's got a little taste to it. And every time I take a little sip of it, I feel burning. <laughs>
As Mike mentioned earlier, the elders encourage everyone to read your Bible every day, read through the Bible in a year. And in my scripture reading this morning, I was reminded, came across a verse that I first realized God's grace. And we go through the Old Testament and we read about all of the requirements that God required of the Israelites, all the sacrifices, the restrictions about the Sabbath. And actually God didn't place the restrictions on the Sabbath. He just said, rest. The Pharisees placed the restrictions on the right. Sabbath. But, and it, it's kind of sounded like you know, going through there, that God has all these things that we have to do. And my scripture this morning was in Micah, Micah chapter six, starting in verse six says, with what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Three things that are pretty simple. And the first two are characteristics of God. To do justly. And to love mercy. And that's all he asked us to do. Is portray the characteristics of God. And what we're doing here today Basically, I can't find in the Bible where it's an absolute requirement to do it. We do it because we want to honor Jesus Christ. We do it because we thank him for his mercy, for his grace, for his love. God's not going to cross us off the book of life if we don't come here and do this but we do it out of love for our god and our savior and i just i just wanted to to share that with you this morning it just hit me as i was reading this morning about the grace of god and what he requires of me to do justly 
not act justly as some translations say, but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with my God. Would you bow with me, please? Father in God, we thank you so much for the life that you have given us, for the breath, for we understand God when you created man it was only man, it was only Adam that you breathed your breath of life into. It doesn't say that he breathed the breath of life into the animals, just mankind, because you wanted to have a relationship with us, a creature that was created in your image and similar to you in, in characteristics. Father, we just thank you for loving us. We thank you for Jesus Christ who came to this earth and lived and died, died for my sins, died for the sins of the world. And for that, Father, we thank you. Words cannot express the gratitude when we realize the price that he paid as he took the beatings that we deserved, as he took the mockings, the spitting in the face, the floggings, and then the ultimate death that you had said, cursed is the man who dies on a tree. And we thank you for loving us so that we do not have to face that sentence because of our sins. Help us to partake of this bread and think of Jesus in a way that would be pleasing and acceptable to you. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament is full of blood, animal sacrifices. If you want to have a relationship with God, you need to offer the Passover lamb. You weren't supposed to eat your food, your meat, if it had blood in it. God told Noah, when Noah came out of the ark, and he began to be able to eat meat, God said to him, you can eat it, you don't eat the blood, you drain it. That's what they mean by kosher. It means the meat's been drained. There's no blood in it. Because everybody knows that meat with blood in it tastes worse than meat without blood. Mm. Uh oh. That's not why he did it. He did it because he was trying to teach men where life comes from. Life doesn't come by us eating other animals that have life in them. Real life comes from God. That includes physical life. Because if God didn't want, we wouldn't be here. If God wasn't thinking about us, we'd be gone. And so all life originates from Jesus, who's God in the flesh. And when he came down here, he saw what man needed. Man was in sin and condemned because they wouldn't accept God. Because there's all these ideas about how God is and what God is and how God acts that take away from God's real character. And sometimes religion is the problem. And so Jesus came down here to show us that God really does love us. 
And how do you do that? By giving us life. But that life required his blood. It required his life. And so as we get ready to drink this cup, remember that it represents for us who are God's people the blood of Jesus. The life that was given to us because Adam and Eve gave up their life, their perfect life. And you and I gave up our perfect life when we sinned. And God needed a perfect life. And since man couldn't do it and God loved man, his word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, glories of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And he came and died on a cross, giving up his life so that we might have life. And that's why Jesus said, real food is to eat his flesh, his body that we just talked about, and to drink his blood that we're going to do now. To remind us that it's by him that we have eternal life and not by our works or our efforts, but through what he's done for us. Would you bow with me, please? Lord God and Father in heaven, we praise you, we glorify you that though we sinned, turned our back on you, have followed other ways instead of following you, have depended on other ideas instead of depending on you, that you cared so much for us that you came down here to serve us. And so you did when your word became flesh and dwelt among us for 30 years. And then he gave up his life, Father, so that we might have that restored relationship with you so that we might have life. We pray that those of us who are your people as we drink this cup, that we remember that it's the blood of your son, Jesus. And for those who are here and aren't your people, we pray that they might see that our faith is in you and in your son, Jesus, so they too might accept the blood and the sacrifice of your son. So we pray, Father, that you help us remember that this is for us the blood of your son, Jesus. In his name, Father, we pray. Amen. Some people think church is business. I was playing tennis yesterday, and one of the tennis players that we were playing against asked me, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a preacher, and I sell a little real estate every once in a while. And he said, how does the church pay you? And I said, by the free will offering of the saints. He said, that's how you get your money? And I told him, we don't sell anything. We don't have a store in our building. We don't sell books. We don't sell CDs. We don't have a Coke machine in the back to make a little extra cash. <laughs> we don't have rummage sales and sell stuff to people. That's why our bazaar is bizarre. But it's the free will offering of the saints because God planned that if you didn't care enough for the word of God to be spread, that it didn't need to be here. But when you willingly give, and not just here, but when you care about spreading the word of God in your neighborhoods, and with your friends, and with those who are less fortunate than you, that's sharing, and that's part of being merciful, which Bill talked about. So as we think about our opportunity to give, remember that God's not commanding you to give. God is saying, I have a work to do. And just like all work here, it needs funds. And if you want to help, you can. But remember, this isn't the only giving we do. Let's pray. Father, in heaven, we're just so thankful that you have given to us the ability to work, to breathe, to live. We thank you for our homes, our houses, our cars, for everything that we have, Father. We praise you and we thank you. We thank you for the ability to work so that we might make a living, not only to be able to support the cause here, but to help those who are less fortunate than we and to give, Father. We pray that you help us to always be generous, knowing that you'll 
give us what we need. So we pray that you help us to be like your son Jesus who gave up his life on the cross. We pray that we give up our life because we understand that the giving of our money is the giving of our life. And so we pray, Father, and we thank you for the ability to do that. And we praise you and glorify you, Father. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Number 194. When we, when we all get to heaven, Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansion prior, blessed in the river of the When we all get to heaven, from a day of rejoicing that will be. Sometimes I'm a little not simple, complicated. Because we're adults in here. We need some meat. We don't need just usual stuff that's all the time. So we're going through the Word of God. We're reading the Word of God. Uh, I was going to mention some other things. Uh, uh, first of all, Andre's here and his family's here. Do you remember, you remember Jill? Jill is uh, Mariel's granddaughter. And I believe that the two kids, they got baptized here, if I remember right. Yeah. Both of them did. And so we're, we're, we're really glad to see them back. And I know that they have been, have been in, in Washington and they're getting ready to move somewhere to Texas. And so we pray that God blesses you and takes care of you guys. It's good to see you again. Uh, the young ladies have grown up. We're very happy to see them. They're, they're really pretty, as, as we would expect, because Jill is married to you, Andre. <laughs> <laughs> And, and Tiny, I'm really excited that your wife loves you so much. She got you a present for Father's Day. 
But you realize that the bracelet has a tracking device in it, right? <laughs> <laughs> John chapter 5, verse 14. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, we have become, uh, uh, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. And the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. You know, maybe you've heard about the Sabbath. So we're going to talk about Jesus and the Sabbath. The reason it's important is because as we're going through the book of John. Jesus seems to do a number of things on the Sabbath day. But let me remind you, as we got into this book, that the, the word of God told us that there is a God and he created the world. And the word is calling people to believe in what he says. But the question is, why should we believe him? Why should we listen to Jesus and not listen to somebody else? Why in the world should we do that? And so let me remind you of what we're covered in chapter five. We had the, the healing of the impotent man when Jesus said to him, you got to get well. And so there was the, the setting for the healing. He was, uh, he was somebody who was there at a, uh, at, a, at a place where poor people were while there was a feast going on because religion really didn't care about him, even though God said you're supposed to care about the poor, and he was there waiting to be put into, into the water. And so we have the ineffective uh, nature of superstition. There was a superstition that when the water is moved, the first guy that gets in there gets healed. Of course, the first guy that got in there must have not been too sick because he was able to get in there. <laughs> But then you have the difference with the word of God, where you have the effective power of the word of God, where Jesus said to him, get up and take your pallet and go home. And he got well. And he, he went out. And then all of a sudden, we have fake religion coming in. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But the first thing we need to understand is that Jesus identifies himself to the man who was impotent. Because what you need to understand, and I don't have time to go through the first half of the sermon, but what you need to understand is that there was such a crowd there because when Jesus went places, there was a crowd. That when the man was there and he heard a voice saying, do you want to get well? And he said, yeah, he said, yes, but I don't he put me in the water. And the voice said, get up and go home and take your pallet. He didn't even know who said it. He didn't know who that was. And that's the reason why in verse 14, it says, afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, behold, you've become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. And the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. And the reason he told the Jews is because they inquired of him, how did you get well? And who told you you could carry your pallet on the Sabbath? See, Jesus identifies himself to the impotent man. And you might say, well, if, G if God just comes for the purpose of healing people, why in the world did he need to tell the man who did it? Is Jesus looking at Jesus, some egotistical God that's up in heaven that goes, I want everybody to serve me and follow me. And if they don't, I'll blow them up. No. See, what we need to understand is that the reason that he went is because people need to know from where their blessings come from. You have to know that. Because that sets up your paradigm in your whole world. It sets up how you think of the world. Evolutionists, people who believe in evolution, they have a different way of looking at the world than you and I do, who are God's people. And the reason is because they have this paradigm set up in their mind, and that's the way it is with religion sometimes. They have this paradigm set up in their mind, and Jesus wants this individual to understand how it is that he received his blessings, because blessings come from God. And we need to remember that. You have to know where your blessings come from. In Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 2, when Jesus, when God called the children of Israel to be his people, he said, if you do these things that I'm teaching you, all these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord. Lord, your God. He said, if you listen to me, I will bless you. It's not if you work hard enough, that's why you get a job. No, God says, I can keep you from getting a job no matter how hard you work. If I want, and I can give you a job. 
But the point is that our blessings come from God. And that's why in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, not only do the physical blessings come from God, but the spiritual blessings come from him. In Ephesians 1 and verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So when it comes to the physical realm of this world, the reason that we are in this beautiful place in our solar system, and at, right at the right place, right at the right moment, with the right amount of water and the right amount of land, is because God's the one who designed it, and he's the one who's blessing us. And the reason you can breathe and the stuff you breathe in doesn't kill you like it will on Mars or on Venus or on Jupiter is because God made it. And in the spiritual realm, every spiritual blessing we have comes from God. Every spiritual blessing. You want to know how to be kind? Look at Jesus. You want to know how to be sacrificial? Look at Jesus. You want to know how to love? Look at Jesus. You want to know how to not be greedy? Look at Jesus. Every spiritual blessing is found in Christ Jesus. And he says to the man, do not, uh, do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. And you might say, well, what does that mean? Well, the man had done something that God had told him not to do. And there's some sins that you can commit that are going to ruin your life. There's people that are living out back here. And all, the homeless people, a lot of them are living the way they're living because they're doing stuff. That's keeping their mind from being able to be productive and help people because they're doing drugs and they're doing all other sorts of stuff. And don't misunderstand me. I'm, I'm not telling you, you know, I'm not looking down on them. I'm just telling you the reality of it. And those activities that they're doing are creating problems for them. There's other people who are so greedy that they've stolen stuff and they're spending their time in jail now. Or they're so lustful they've committed adultery and, they're, and they have to not live with their children anymore. There's activities that we do, that when we do them, there's going to be consequences. And God is saying to this man, who have you been listening to? Because that's really what we need to understand. He wants us to know who to listen to. And, if, and in John 5 and verse 14, he says, do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. Well, the first thing I want to ask is what sin? And God says, sin is violating my law. Who are you listening to? Who are you going to hear? Who are you going to follow? You see, it's about who you listen to. That's why Jesus said to his disciples in Luke chapter 6 and verse 47, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you who he is like. And you remember the rest of the story, right? He's like the guy that built his house on the rock as opposed to the guy that built his house on the sand. And you remember what happened to the guy that built his house on the sand, right? The storms came, the winds blew, and what happened? The house fell. But the person who built his house on the rock, see, storms are still going to come. And problems are still going to develop. But the guy who builds his house on the rock, his life is going to continue. So the question is, who are you going to listen to? And that's why Jesus wants this man to know. you got to know. Because if you don't know, your whole paradigm is messed up in your world. And by the way, I appreciate Ben. He corrected my spelling on the word paradigm. It would have been a different word. In John 5 and verse 15, it says, the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. And why did he do that? Because he was a Jew and he was a religious Jew. And that's who you go talk to about religion. You go talk to religious people about Jews. People find out I'm a preacher and they come and ask me all kinds of religious questions. They don't ask a lawyer religious questions. And so when the Pharisees came to him and said, who told you you could carry your stuff on the Sabbath day? That's his religion. And he said, I don't know. I guess I can make, try to find out. And Jesus met him and said, it was me. And so now that he knows, he's going to go talk to his religion. He says, hey, it was this guy named Jesus who told me I could carry it on the Sabbath day. Because no doubt, his religion made him feel guilty about what he was doing. Right. You know, religion's good about that. Religion's good about making us feel guilty about what religion thinks we ought to do. But being one of God's people is not about religion. It's about a relationship with God. And that's why in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 30, talking about some blind people, he said to these blind people, and their eyes were open, and Jesus sternly warned them, see that no one knows about this. So it is interesting that here Jesus didn't tell this guy, don't tell anybody. But he did tell the blind guys, don't tell anybody. Well, why in the world would he want this guy to tell somebody, but he wouldn't want the blind guys to tell somebody? Well, you have to wait for the blind guy when we get there. But I want to talk to you about this guy first. God did not tell him, look, I made you well, don't tell anybody. You think Jesus knew that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were saying to him, who told you to carry it? 
See, God not only is going to identify himself to the impotent man, but he's going to identify himself to religion because he wants us to, he wants religion to understand that it's not about religion. It's not about us. It's not about the rules and the regulations that we make or that religion makes. See, there's a, there's a conflicting nature of religion and the word. And a lot of people, when they think of religion or when they think of God, they think of religion instead of thinking about God. And what God's going to do for, for you and for us. Verse 16 through 18. It says, for this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, my father is working until now and I myself am working for this reason. Therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he, uh, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. You might read that and you might go, huh? Well, if you do that, it's because you don't understand what the Sabbath is. So we need to spend a little bit of time understanding what the Sabbath is. Because that's the problem, wasn't it? The problem wasn't they didn't say who made you well. The problem was you're carrying down the Sabbath day. That was the problem. And Jesus knew that the impotent man was going to tell his religion. Jesus did it. Now, why would Jesus let him do that? Because Jesus is trying to teach us something. But we have to understand what the Sabbath is about. And you might say, I know what the Sabbath is about. Sabbath is Sunday. We come to church and it's supposed to be given to the Lord. No, no. That's Sunday. I'm talking the Sabbath. In the Old Testament, in the Ten Commandments, they were supposed to keep the Sabbath holy. Sunday is not the Sabbath. It never has been the Sabbath, never will be the Sabbath. God never changed the Sabbath to Sunday. The Sabbath is Saturday. It's the last day of the week. Sunday starts a new day, which is interesting when we worship is on a new day. So you got to understand what the Sabbath is. So where do we have to go? We have to go to the Old Testament. Let's see what the Sabbath says so we can read about what God says and what it's supposed to be. In Exodus chapter 31 and verse 12, we have to understand that it was commanded by God. Verse 12, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, this whole section is going to be on the Sabbath. It's commanded by God. It wasn't invented by man. It was commanded Israel. In chapter 31 and verse 13, the first part says, but as for you, talking to Moses, but as for you, speak to the sons of Israel saying, you shall observe my Sabbath. God never told a Gentile anywhere in the Bible, even in New Testament times, to keep the Sabbath. It was commanded to Israel. And remember, the impotent man was living under the Jewish system. He was a Jew living in Jerusalem and would be under the regulations of the Sabbath. In verse 13 uh, of chapter 31, it says, for, it, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generation. So God says the Sabbath is a sign for Israel and me. This is a sign for you and me, Israel. Now, what does a sign do? A sign points to something. See, somebody's been in my class. A sign points to something else. You're, we're driving down the street with your with your wife, and she goes, oh, a sail. <laughs> she doesn't run to the window and grab the window and go, oh, just what I needed. She goes inside because the sign points to something. God said, Israel. The Sabbath is a sign. It's going to point to something. I'm giving it to you and me so it'll point to something. Because Israel was supposed to be the people of God. And they were also the billboard of God. They were God's billboard. This is how God advertised his stuff by his nation. Isn't that what you would expect? If you're an American and you go somewhere else, wouldn't people expect you to act American? Well, when Israel would go somewhere, they would expect Israel to act Israel. They would expect them to act like God's people. And God says, one of the things you're going to do is on, on the Sabbath day, you're going to be different than the rest of the world so that people can wonder and ask why. And in the last part of verse 13, you have to understand the purpose that he said the sign was for. He says in verse 13, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. God says to Israel, I'm giving you the sign of the Sabbath. It's a sign between you and me, and the purpose for it is that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. God says the Sabbath is supposed to teach you something about what I do for you. By the way, in case you're wondering the word sanctify means set apart, you can just simply change it to saved. 
redeemed, any one of those words would fit in there. And the word Lord, you notice, is in all capital letters, capital O, capital, uh, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's because in the Hebrew, it's actually the word Yahweh. Right. And Yahweh was God's covenant name. That's the name God used when he talked with his covenant people when he made an agreement with them. When Kitty and I talk, when Kitty and I talk, she calls me Mike. I call her Pumpkin. That's my covenant name with her. That's what I call her. My daughter has a covenant name with me. She calls me Padre. That's how she called me. A covenant name is a special relationship that you have with somebody. And every one of us have it. You might even call your nickname, but all of us have it. And God says, this is going to show you this, the Sabbath day. The purpose for it is to be a sign to show you that I, the Lord, who have a covenant with you, and the one who's going to save you and sanctify you and take care of you. And so he says, don't profane it. Now, the word profane doesn't mean to curse and cuss. The word profane just means to make it normal, to make it like every other day in the world. In verse 14, he's going to tell us how that's done. He says, therefore, you are to observe the Sabbath, for it is, uh, it is holy to you. In other words, it's set apart. It's a different day. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person will be cut off from among his people. Oh, so now he says, if you do any work on the Sabbath day, you're going to be cut off from among the people. And if you work on it, then you're making it just like every other day. He says, the thing that makes it not like every other day is that you don't work on the Sabbath. Now, that's why Sunday is not the Sabbath, because some of you go to work on, on Sunday. And that's okay. You want to do that. Some of you go home to your computers, and, you know, we're remote, remotely working. Seems like we're working all the time now. But you're remotely working, and you, you're, you're working, and you can do it on, on Sunday. God, they're going to send a lightning bolt down and kill you. Why not? Because it's not the Sabbath. People sometimes try to make Sunday like the Sabbath. But he says, therefore, you are to observe the Sabbath for it is a holy, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it will surely be put to death. And how do you profane it? Well, by working, you're going to be cut off from among the people. You profane it by work. So we're going to have to ask the question, work? I mean, the thing that makes the Sabbath different than every other day, it has to do with work? And the answer is yes. Remember, this is for Israel. And by this idea of work, it's going to show you that the Lord sanctifies you. The Lord sets you apart. Well, then we need to do some work on work. You remember work? Remember when God created Adam and put him in the garden and said, I have some work for you to do. Remember that? No, you don't. <laughs> because God never said that. God said, I do have some activity for you to do, but he never called it work. It wasn't until after they sinned, and after they sinned, God then says this to Adam. He says in verse 17, then the Lord, uh, uh, then to Adam, he said, God said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles. It shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And he says, now you're going to have to work. You ever heard the expression, if you love what you do, then you'll never work a day in your life? Have you ever heard that expression? Uh -huh. Okay. Well, God put him in the Garden of Eden. It wasn't work. They loved it. But then they listened to the wrong person. And now all of a sudden they have to work. You see, work, and the reason you and I work, to eat, is because of the physical consequences of sin in our world. Before sin entered into the world, Adam just reached up and grabbed a banana and ate it. He grabbed a mango and eat it. He grab a papaya and oh, you can't tell I'm Mexican, can you? <laughs> he would eat all these things they were there god supplied it god gave it to them but now it's not like that now you got to have them shipped in from somewhere and they make you pay for it go figure 
Try walking in the store and taking one without paying for it. Although our culture is changing today, that drives me nuts. Verse 19 it says, by the, sweat of your, by the sweat of your face, you will eat bread till you return to the ground because from it you were taken. For you are dust and to dust you shall return. Back to chapter 31, verse 15. Notice what he says. Remember, you're supposed to keep the day holy, right? Holy means don't work, right? Let's see. Verse 15. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day there is a Sabbath of complete rest. Holy the Lord, whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall surely be put to death. So let's see if I get this straight. God said the Sabbath is for Israel. It's commanded by God. They're supposed to do it every Sabbath. They're supposed to rest on the Sabbath. By the way, it doesn't say they have to go to the temple. It doesn't say they have to go to synagogue school. It doesn't say they have to do, did anyone have, it doesn't even say they have to read the Torah. It just says don't work. That's what it says. And anybody who tells you today that you got to go to church on, on Saturday, the first thing I'd ask them is, where, where in the world does the Bible teach that you have to go to do anything on the Sabbath? I thought you were supposed to rest. You don't have to go anywhere or do anything. You rest. So, it's a rest. If you work, he says, then you profane it. Six days you get to work. The seventh day, God says, no work. My competition is going to kill me. Because they work seven days. They're going to kill me. I'm sorry. And why is it that if you profane it, you die? It's real simple. I've told you this over and over. You believe in God and what? Live. You live. You don't believe in God and you die. die. If you don't recognize the Sabbath, you're going to die because you're not recognizing what God does for you. That's why Jesus had to tell the impotent man, I did it. And that's why Jesus has to tell religion, I do it. I'm the one who blesses people. I'm the one who does that. Not some priest, not some preacher. Not some guy who went to school and has a bunch of degrees behind his name. God says, I'm the one who blesses you. And it was to be celebrated. In verse 16, it says, so the sons of Israel shall observe the Sabbath to celebrate the Sabbath throughout their generation as a perpetual covenant. They were supposed to enjoy the day. They're supposed to enjoy the day. They weren't supposed to come to the Sabbath and go, oh, we got to sing. Oh, we got to read that book again. Oh, we got to listen to that preacher over there talk. It was to be celebrated. They would enjoy it. God gave it to them to enjoy it. And that's what we're supposed to do when we come to worship. And when we sing, we're supposed to enjoy singing, not just to cross off one of the five things that we think God said we we're supposed to do on the Sabbath day, on Sunday. But we sing because we love to sing doing it. And it doesn't really bother me whether I sing good or not. It might bother you. Because <laughs> God's listening to our heart. That's what God's listening to. And verse 17. And if you do that properly, notice what he says in verse 17. It is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. But on the seventh day he ceased from labor and was... I don't have to go to work on Saturday. I can go swimming. I can take a leisurely stroll. Oh, wait a minute. No, I can't because the Jews say I can't carry my towel. Because the Jews say if I walk more than an eighth of a mile, I'm violating the Sabbath. Oh, no. Now, all of a sudden, the Sabbath becomes a burden to me. And that's what happens in religion. Religion makes all these rules to keep you with them. To keep you here. We make all these rules. Because we want you to stay here. Here, not the other place, here. 
But when you come to church and you leave, you're supposed to feel like Leroy. It was good. It was great seeing the brethren. It was wonderful being able to talk with one another. And Mike was okay, I guess. It's supposed to refresh us. It's supposed to renew us. It's supposed to make us glad we're Christians. In verse 17, Jesus, going back in John chapter 5, says to those religious people, but he answered them, my father is working until now, and I myself am working in. Scratch our heads. What in the world does that mean? Well, let me give you a Bible example so you know. And this Bible example has to do with manna. Remember what manna was? Remember when the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness and they didn't have a lot of food? God in the morning would allow manna to be there in the dew, and the people were supposed to go out and they were supposed to take an omer of, of manna and they were put it in a jar and they were supposed to eat it. You remember that? Well, let's do a little bit of reading about that just so that you see it comes from the word of God. In Exodus 16, verse 15, it says, When the sons of Israel saw it, the, man, the manna, they said to one another, What is it? Which, by the way, is what manna means. What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather it every man as much as he should eat. By the way, as much as he should eat, it's an omer. It says in verse 16, you shall take an omer apiece according to the number of persons each of you has in his tent. And the sons of Israel did so, and some gathered much and some gathered little. And when they measured it, measured it with an omer, he who had gathered uh, much had no excess, and he who gathered little had no lack. In other words, what that means is, as they went out and picked it up, some people didn't have a measuring thing, and some picked more, and some picked less. But when the, this guy that picked more scraped his off, he gave it to the guy who picked less. And he had the exact same amount because that's what we do with one another. We take what God gives us and we give it to somebody else who has less than we do. And some days we might need it. So they'll give us what they have because we need it. And together we'll be able to maintain ourselves every day of our life. And that's what, the, that's what the church of God did. That's what the church of Jesus Christ did in Acts chapter 2 when they shared with one another so that there was nobody who had need. But it says, and every man gathered as much as he should eat. Verse 19, and it wasn't to be saved. Verse 19, Moses said to them, let no, let no man leave any of it until morning. But they did not listen to Moses, and some left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and became foul, and Moses was angry with them. You see, God says, I'm promising you only today. And God only promises you today. That's right. He says, he's going to give you enough for today because you don't know you're going to be here tomorrow. But God says, if you're here tomorrow, I'll take care of tomorrow too. But today I'm taking care of today, one day. And if you fail, it turns to worms. And have you ever noticed that? Have you noticed that in your closets and in your, and in your garages, if you just keep stuff there stored without ever using it, what happens to it? It rots and the clothes become worn and nobody got any use out of it because we were selfish. Yes. And I said, someday I'll use it. And you know what happened with someday, right? But they did not listen to Moses, and some left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and became foul, and Moses was angry with them, as you'd expect. And it only lasted one day. In verse 21, it says, of Exodus 16, and they gathered it morning by morning, every man as much as he should eat, but when the sun grew hot, it would melt. So there was only enough for the day, and if you kept it the next day, it rotted. So you had to go out every single day and pick it out. Every day. Every day. Except for Friday. You know what Friday is, right? It's the day before Saturday. I figured that out. <laughs> Verse 22. It says, now, on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one. When all the uh, uh, leaders of the congregation came to, to, uh, and told Moses, then he said to them, now, here's why the leaders are coming to talk to Moses. Moses, you know, we started this on Monday, and now here Friday. You want us to grab two times as much on Friday? Well, it's going to rot, because that's what it does the next day. It rots. So they came to him and they were asking him, what about this? And he says in verse 23, this is what the Lord meant. 
Tomorrow is a Sabbath observance, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil. This is on Friday. And boil what you will boil. And all that is left over, put aside to be kept until morning. But it's going to turn into worms. It's going to rot. So they put it aside until morning as Moses had ordered. And it did not become foul. Nor were there any worms in it. That's weird bread. No. Remember what the Sabbath was for? It was a sign to show you that I, the Lord, am the one who blesses you. They accused Jesus of working on the Sabbath. How dare Jesus? Tell that man to do that on the Sabbath day. And how dare Jesus heal that man on the Sabbath day? Why didn't the bread turn to worms? Because God was working on the Sabbath to keep them alive. God doesn't stop working on the Sabbath. The Sabbath doesn't control God. God controls the Sabbath. That's why Jesus said, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. And that's why Jesus said, you're supposed to do good on the Sabbath. You see, but Jesus' actions violated the Jewish paradigm. It violated their paradigm. Why men can't do that? Verse 18 says, for this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he was not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And by the way, that idea of making himself equal with God means he was equal with God. In John 1, 1, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, but it was the word who was in the beginning. He was with God and was God. And he came down. He's God. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I don't know everything how God works. All I know is what God tells me. Amen. And they understood that when Jesus said, my father and I are working, that Jesus is claiming the identity of God. He's claiming the identity of God. But he's breaking the Sabbath. That's because they have this paradigm set up in their mind. Because if you see Jesus only as a man, then they're right. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Uh, now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am, that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. They said, he's a really good guy. And if he was a man, he would be violating the Sabbath teaching. I have a friend named Jim. He drove down the freeway 100 miles an hour. <laughs> violating the law. But they didn't arrest him. Because he was a cop. He was chasing somebody who needed to be arrested. You see, if you see Jesus only as a man, then yes, he violated the law. He broke it. But if you see Jesus as God's divine son, then you have a paradigm shift. So Jesus continued with the disciples and says, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter said, you are a divine being. And if he's a divine being, then the Sabbath is when he should be doing his work. Do 
Because the Sabbath is a sign that points to the fact that God loves you. He's going to take care of you. He's going to give you a day of rest. So that you can know that he's the one who provides for you. He's the one who takes care of you. He's the one who blesses you. That's why in Matthew 11 and verse 28, it says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, sometimes people don't come to Jesus because they don't see their life as burdened. Because everything is going okay for them. They're managing to control everything and keep everything in check. But when things start falling apart, they're going to have to look to somebody who cares about them and helps them. And that's Jesus. You see, he must work on the Sabbath to prove God provides for man's needs. Because in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 45, it says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, if you're one of his people and you claim to be a follower of him, then that's your statement too. I didn't come to be served. I didn't come for my wife to be my slave. I came to serve her. I didn't come for the taxpayers to pay me so I could become rich if I'm a politician. I work for their good. And that's the way the world's supposed to work. But the Jewish paradigm in John 8 and verse 41, when they're talking about Jesus to each other, they said, you are doing the deeds of your father. They said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father. God, so kill Jesus. And they do. People kill Jesus today. They kill him intellectually. They kill him emotionally. They, de they deny his word. They believe in science. They believe in philosophy. They believe in their feelings. They believe in everything except for what God says. And so the real question is, what's your paradigm? Oh, and I misspelled it. What's your paradigm? How do you view Jesus? Is he just a wonderful religious teacher and a man like the Muslims think? Is he a created being like the Jehovah Witnesses want you to believe? Is he some force that's out there that kind of ethereal? Or is he really God, a being who's different than us, who we're created in his image, and who loves us and wants to help us? What's your paradigm? God spoke creation into existence by his word. And the world is and the word is still working to help those who willingly repent. Therefore, those who believe Jesus is divine and listen to him, repent, they change and are born again of water and the spirit. Got a song to sing. It's on your papers. Like, yeah. Holy Spirit, dwell in me. Thank you. Touch my eyes that I might see. All your goodness is grace and power. Stay beside me every hour. Be my drink in my living bread. And keep me shattered, keep me fed. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, dwell in me. Holy Spirit, comfort me. Let my heart be one with thee. When I'm buried, soothe my heart. Let me sleep until it finds. 
So that even though I might do you wrong, you're saying, Father, forgive me. Because you know not what you do. Shall we bow at this time? Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace, thanksgiving in our hearts, while our hearts have been made to believe of thy holy and righteous word. For the life that you have given us, the power to overcome sin and to live as children of man. We thank you for your word that has been preached this day and for our understanding. May we so live that the world and those about us may not see us in Jesus, but see Jesus in us. Amen. We acknowledge that too many times we leave undone things we ought to have done. Pray that you will forgive us and give us the power to forgive those who have given us the power to forgive those who trespass against. I pray that the grace of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, to rest and abide with us both now and forever. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we the humble prayer and ask you to bless you. Amen. 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 Oh, if you didn't see the sign, you're supposed to pick your kids up if you want them. Uh, Bill Myers is out of town. They're supposed to be back on Tuesday. Remember that we have some love snacks in the back here. That's little packages that you can pick up to give to people at the corners if somebody stops you or sees somebody in need. It's just some, some food, some water, little snacks for them. Uh, ladies Fellowship, make sure you, you see uh, Linda. She's planning uh, to start that. She'll let you know when. I remember that we have our Wednesday study face-to-face -to -face in the morning at 10 and 7, and also it's online. And our Sunday morning Bible study is still online right now. And uh, somebody asked me when we're starting our regular services, and uh, we really haven't decided yet. We'll, we'll see how things go. We're glad you're all here, and pray the Lord blesses you. Hang on for just a minute while I close this up here, and then we'll get out of here. <laughs>